From Olympic City and the home of Pikes Peak, this is the Automotive ADHD Show. Hello and welcome into another weekly edition of the Automotive ADHD Podcast. Matt West here hanging out with you on a beautiful, uh, kind of chilly day here in Colorado. I think we're finally getting into that Thanksgiving season. I mean, well, this is Thanksgiving week, but we're getting into a little bit colder temperatures. It's chilly, you know, but still nice enough. No snow on the ground. Perfect time to still go cruise with friends on the weekend, go get some coffee, drive the car around. Lots of good stuff there. And I've got a lot of good things to talk about today. I've got stuff on the automotive chip shortage. There's some new developments on that since I last talked about it a couple months ago. Also going to be talking about the physics behind an interesting phenomenon that happens in both front-wheel drive cars and rear-wheel drive cars. This is really cool, especially if you do a lot of driving in the winter or if you do performance driving. Uh, And then Toyota, they have formed a Team Japan in an effort to keep the internal combustion engine alive. This is really cool. You want to stick around for that at the end of the show. Now, before we get into any of that, I do want to say, you know, this is Thanksgiving week. You know, what are some of the things that you're thankful for, right? People always ask that. Well, if we apply that to a context with cars... Think an automotive Thanksgiving, right? Think of that. What am I thankful for with cars? I mean, I I, I love VTEC. I'm thankful for that. Individual throttle bodies, uh, 200 treadwear tires. Gotta love those sticky tires. Manual transmissions, intercoolers, open source engine management. All of these things are great. And of course, all those times that my car actually started when I wanted it to. So, yeah, that's... That's probably a probably a pretty big one right there. That's usually the most important part. So there we go. That's what I'm thankful for. Let me know what you are thankful for with cars. I got the uh, new Automotive ADHD Facebook page up. So I'm going to put a post up there. Comment below on that. Alternatively, you can email me, matt at throttlewarrior.com. And, of course, all things Throttle Warrior can be found at throttlewarrior.com. Come, ladies, gentlemen, Volkswagen Super Beetles, let's talk about the automotive chip shortage. So it has been... A couple of months since my last coverage on the chip shortage. That was uh, several episodes ago, but if you do want to go grab that, that is going to be, I believe, the first episode of this show. We've been going for a couple months now. How cool is that? But, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is still prudent, and, uh, you know, I think... I made a prediction that a lot of manufacturers were going to have to start going in-house to manufacture their chips. And that's what's happening here. So, you know, and I'm not going to say I called it. That's a pretty obvious, um, you know, solution. But, you know, just a quick recap, if you haven't listened to that episode, you know, and maybe you're not as aware of the automotive chip shortage, um, you know, the manufacturers have been having a really tough time, heavy issues with the supply chain relating to computer components. And this, of course, is a problem, you know, when you make cars that are modern and they have all sorts of computer things on them. And, uh, you know... You know, think, you know, electronic control modules, ECUs, you know, engine control computers, um, you know, touch screens, all this stuff. I mean, everything relies on semiconductors and computer chips uh, in cars. And, uh, you know, the thing is, those those chips are not usually made by the manufacturers of the car. You know, Toyota, for instance, will manufacture the car and they're making all the parts. But the actual nitty gritty semiconductors and little, you know, silicon chips on you know, circuit boards, they don't make those in the Toyota factory. They buy those somewhere else and then they put them together on their own circuit boards. And then that makes ultimately, you know, a component that they use in a car. Uh, And these chips have been in, there's been a drastic shortage of them, uh, obviously because of the pandemic last year. And uh, a lot of this is due to the fact that the consumer electronics industry, which also uses these chips, you know, at the end of the the day, these components aren't all that different from a car versus a microwave oven versus a video game console versus your laptop. You know, they're at the the heart of things, kind of the same components. And uh, what happens is, you know, you have a pandemic and everyone starts working remote and starts buying up tons of computers, laptops, cameras, all of the above. And then the automotive industry, which, you know, also needs these parts, is not getting them. And also the pandemic, too, caused issues with, you know, the manufacturing of these parts on top of that. So there was a huge demand increase for them. And the manufacturing of them kind of flatlined because people weren't working with the pandemic. So, you know, people working in the factories who make these uh, components. So that has led manufacturers to rethink, though, how they build cars. Volkswagen, by the way is famous for using a method in their factories where 
parts and components arrive just in time to be put on other cars going down the assembly line. They have the supply chain down to such a science that certain parts come in from other factories, other locations, just in time. They call it the just-in-time method. Uh, and that no longer works when you have supply chain interruptions. That's that's a system, it's very German, by the way. It's a very German system, very fitting of Volkswagen to do that. But that's something that only works when the supply chain is working correctly. When that supply chain is not working, then you have issues. And uh, as a result, Volkswagen has had to start stockpiling parts, um, you know, and building warehouses and having places to keep all these parts where previously they didn't do that before. A lot of other manufacturers do that, but Volkswagen, they didn't. Well, now they have to, um, you know, so they can stockpile parts and save them for times when the supply chain is not as robust. Now, this is also, you know, one solution. And like I said, uh, um, is to just make your own chips. So you can't have supply chain problems if you skirt around the supply chain. If you completely eliminate the need of the supply chain, then supply chain issues don't affect you. And that is what Ford has announced they will do. They announced the, that this week. Uh, they partnered with a company called Global Foundries, saying it's a, quote, strategic collaboration. Now, this is going to improve their ability to make these chips in-house for their cars uh, and not be as affected by global things and trade and, you know, all this politics and, of course, pandemics. It's going to greatly improve their ability to not be subject to that. And it's going to separate them from, you know, their automotive semiconductor industry from the consumer electronic semiconductor industry. So they won't be as affected by you know, swings in markets for other things like that. So that's cool. That could be a good thing. Now, they also said a benefit that could actually help, you know, you and me, the actual drivers of these cars. They say they can better, by doing this stuff in-house, better customize those chips to do the tasks they're made for instead of buying something that's, you know, for all sorts of applications and they just, you know, kind of contort it to do this one thing. Well, they can make these in-house and they can make them really specific for these really special systems that they have and this they say that's going to improve you know self-driving systems and battery management systems and uh, all sorts of electronics in the car should be improved by that which is all good my take is that this could be kind of a dangerous thing too uh because you know the downside to this is when you have a manufacturer that starts making all of their stuff in-house that stuff then becomes really proprietary so if you need to get a you know uh, let's say a new engine control computer for you know whatever reason you need a new ecu right so you could go to the ford dealer and buy one or you could traditionally go into the aftermarket and find a refurbished one, a rebuilt one. You know, someone would be able to take a damaged one and get off-the-shelf parts from the same place Ford buys them from and fix it and then sell it to you at a reduced cost. And guess what? It's just as good as brand new. So um, the problem is when that goes proprietary, those off-the-shelf chips and parts that someone could buy and refurbish and repair with are not available because the manufacturer is doing them in-house. That means no one else has them. Only Ford has them. You can't go to whatever other XYZ manufacturer and get them so that can cause problems for you know things when it comes to uh, right to repair that's a really big topic uh, in the mainstream right now uh, especially like with Apple computers you know them trying to lock you out of being able to repair your own stuff that could very much happen with cars if all of these parts go in-house will it be that big of a deal I don't think so because a lot of car parts and a lot of aftermarket you know suppliers have already figured out ways to replicate things that are done in-house but uh, that that is a potential downside to it. So that could inhibit the ability to repair or modify these cars, which honestly doesn't matter to Ford because they're only really interested in the first time buyers buying these cars brand new. And, you know, who these people who get them serviced at the dealership, you know, m people like me, car enthusiasts who are buying these cars, you know, and we're the fifth or sixth or seventh owner of the car. You know, Ford could care less about people like me when it comes to that point. And uh, then, you know, us car enthusiasts get stuck with the challenge of, gosh, how do I fix this thing that has no factory support anymore that I can't get parts for because they're locked down or they're out of production now. So that's where I see that causing some problems. Overall, probably not that big of a deal. Uh, some other manufacturers have announced they're going in-house. Hyundai is doing this. Um, now, what is interesting, too, is manufacturers like BMW and Tesla, instead of you know going in-house with their chips, because honestly, going in-house does make the production of the car more expensive. That is also one downside to this is, you know, outsourcing your chip production to suppliers 
is typically cheaper than setting up all the manufacturing yourself to do it in your own factory and hire workers. So that could, uh, you know, that that could cause the cost of cars to go up as well. I guess I should have mentioned that. But now with BMW uh, and Tesla, they have foregone having certain luxury features like power adjustable lumbar support and premium audio systems and uh, wireless phone chargers. BMW is going to be on some models ditching digital keys. Get an old fashioned key for that car again. How, how weird would that be in 2021 going on 2022? Yeah, I'm unlocking my car with a key. Um, I mean, I still do that because my cars are all old and crusty, but hey, <laughs> what can you do? I'm curious to see how this changes things long term in the industry. Uh, some experts are saying that supply chain issues could be ending in 2022, late 2022, early 2023. Uh, that doesn't mean these manufacturers are not going to go in-house. If you invest all the money to tool up your factories and create production of your own semiconductors, you're not going to just stop doing that once you know more stuff becomes available. You're like, I already got this stuff. We're just going to keep building our own thing. So again, I think that overall cost will be floated down to the consumer. That will make cars a little bit more expensive. And having cars be more expensive, that's the last thing we want, right? We're already being told that cars are getting more expensive because of other supply issues. And, uh, you know, the used car market is going absolutely bonkers. So hopefully this stuff will level out. Hopefully the end result is we all get a better product. We all get better cars and we don't really have to pay too much more for them. That would be, you know, ideal being able to go to a dealer and just buy a car at MSRP and then just leave with that car day of. That's like how it used to be, right? So um, also, I, I did see something funny uh, when I was uh, researching some of this. There was someone who commented on a on a post saying that, uh, you know, with manufacturers taking chips out of cars like BMW and Tesla, will Porsche charge more for the chip delete option? And I think the answer to that, we all know Porsche, they... Uh, take stuff out of cars in the name of weight reduction and then charge you more for taking it out of the car. So, yes, I think the answer is Porsche will charge more for the chip delete option. Also, I think there is a silver lining to, um, you know, having less chips. Less chips could equal more good. Like, think about it this way. If there were no chips left to make automatic transmissions, everyone would be stuck driving manual transmissions again, and the world would just be a better place. So, that is... Uh, that is the uh, silver lining here. Maybe that'll happen. I, it's wishful thinking, right? So on that note, I'm going to take a quick break, but I will be back in the next segment to talk about some interesting things with front-wheel drive versus rear-wheel drive and the physics behind it. This is really good, especially if you do a lot of winter driving. You need to stick around for that. I'll be back. Every day, thousands go without the ability to buy necessary and life-saving parts parts like turbos, coilovers, and wheels. I'm Steve, turbocharged BRZ. It doesn't run because I can play with my connecting rod through the hole in my block. Project cars sit unfinished, waiting for parts, collecting dust. My name is Todd, and I bought a rotary. It's okay, bro, we'll uh, swap it. But no more. You, yes you, can make a difference. For as little as $5 per month, you can put an end to Project Car suffering and support your favorite podcast. Patreon.com slash Throttle Warrior. Donate now and receive special perks. Sponsored by Autoholics Anonymous and the Speed Council. Yeah, and we are back rocking it. Those car sounds sounding fantastic, by the way. Those are courtesy of Josh Maldonado, and that is his 2007 Acura TL Type S on the dyno. He said it's making 294 horsepower to the wheel. I bet that is a ton of fun. That could be your car sound, by the way. Email your car sounds to me, Matt at ThrottleWarrior.com, or you can post those up now on the new Automotive ADHD podcast Facebook page. It is really cool. I'll have a post up there. You can comment down below. Post your car sounds there. By the way, Josh not only sent in his car sound, but he also works at a NSX tuning shop uh, in Massachusetts and uh, sent in tons of fantastic photos of all the cars they work on. A really cool supercharged build they did. Awesome stuff. I'm going to get some of that uh, as the week rolls on up on the um, Facebook page as well. You got to check it out. It looks like they do some really fantastic work there. So shout out to you, Josh. Appreciate you sending that in. So 
We're getting on to a couple of things. Uh, speaking of, like, you know, Hondas and Acuras and stuff, last week I talked about the new Integra and why I think it's kind of just, you know, an expensive Civic and you're probably better off just buying the Civic Si. But I left out one crucial piece of information. Someone brought this up to me. Uh, there was an article online that talked about how Ford used Integra, or almost did. They almost used the name Integra for the Ford Taurus. Yeah, so when they were developing the Ford Taurus, turns out they had, you know, a committee where they came up with a bunch of different names, and they had several names, including uh, Probe, which later became a different car. The Aerostar also became a different car. Optima, hmm, that sounds familiar. The Lumina, Chevy used that one. And then finally, the Integra. And uh, they decided that Integra was not a very good name, and uh, fittingly, Acura took it and put it on an awesome car. So... You know, <laughs> there you go. That would have been weird, by the way. Ford Integra. That just doesn't that doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well as, yeah, I don't know. Then again, it could be worse. Think of this. Acura Taurus. Nope. Acura Probe. <laughs> nope. Uh, maybe Acura Mustang. No, that still still doesn't work. Um, as a side note, I, I looked this up. Integra uh, comes from Latin, by the way. It has nothing to do with Japanese, but it comes from Latin, uh, loosely meaning important or, you know, integral to something. Uh, also a weirdly popular name for girls uh, in Latin-based languages. So uh, would I date a girl named Integra? Yeah. You, you you bet I would. You bet I would. Um, now, speaking of, by the way, of um, front-wheel drive cars like the Acura Important, uh, I had a discussion with my good friend, OBD1 Kenobi, also known as Brian. He was on the show a couple episodes ago talking about mechanic myths. He was debunking a bunch of them. Uh, he is a career mechanic, and uh, if you're interested in hearing that and you haven't, go listen to that episode. Now, his side business, though, is being an automotive tuner. He programs standalone ECUs, um, you know, mega squirts, uh, Haltex, AEMs, uh, Speedduinos, my personal favorite, running my 86 on one of those. Uh, but he was uh, you know, telling me that he was tuning a customer car. He was riding shotgun just you know, checking some things on his laptop while the customer was driving and uh, noticed an interesting phenomenon when they did a pull. You know, and this car is boosted and it's running about 450 wheel horsepower and that's uh, rear wheel drive. And they noticed that if they keep the throttle position and the same, you know, if you're going in a straight line, exact same pull, uh, you know, the car wasn't breaking traction. Well, it can still break traction, but the, at that where they were at, you know, with the throttle, it wasn't. But if they maintained that speed and then went up a hill suddenly, the car would, the rear tires would suddenly start spinning, even though they weren't spinning with that level of power. The power hadn't changed, wasn't spinning on dry traction, flat level ground, suddenly spinning, going up a hill. And uh, we got into an interesting discussion about this, but it brought up some really interesting ideas. And I did some research, and this is all tied into a phenomenon with traction that can relate to how rear-wheel drive cars uh, react, you know, at the limit of traction, but as well as front-wheel drive cars. And this is particularly important if you do any sort of of performance driving or heaven forbid you have to drive in winter time where there is snow a good chunk of this country uh has lots of snow in the winter except you california you don't count but anyway <laughs> anyway now lots of snow in a lot of parts of the country and uh this has you know some really interesting implications if you're just a daily driver driving in the winter or if you're on track or you're doing a hill climb so basically what's happening here right again he's keeping the throttle input exactly the same on flat ground and then starts to climb a hill and then the rear tires start spinning they break traction why is that now this is cool stuff because um you, when you have your tires in traction and you know i have experience with performance driving i've done a lot of track driving uh very good on you know back roads as well and things like that i have a lot of experience driving cars pretty fast i do autocross time attack uh, hell i've even done drag racing too but uh, that that's less applicable to what's going on here but um but that said uh what's going on is you know keeping that throttle input the same on flat ground then going up a hill losing traction well that happens and this can be explained with kind of um a notion thinking of your tire traction in the terms of like points right there's obviously physics that go behind this and there's actual numbers and actual you know newtons of force and the shearing you know tension of the rubber on the you know tarmac whatever we're not going to get into any of that i <laughs> terrible in math class i couldn't get into that if i wanted to but it can be simply explained using this methodology of saying you have a certain number of traction points your tires 
are only capable of a certain amount of grip. And if we just uh, uh, you know assign an arbitrary number to that, like 10 traction points total, that's how much it takes to break free. Like That's how much you have. As soon as you hit 11 points, then your tire is spinning. You're breaking traction. Well... Imagine that you are accelerating and you're using, you know, all 10 traction points, right? Again, you go past that, you spin. Well, what if you're at that maximum? The tires can only cope with so much grip before they lose traction. And uh, and this is only going in a straight line. Now, this methodology does apply to corner driving as well, where you have to balance how much acceleration you have. You have a certain number of points for accelerating, you have a certain number of points for cornering, and you have a certain number of points for braking. And as soon as you exceed that in any way, you're going to lose traction in one of those directions. But keeping things simple, we're in a straight line, no corners, no braking. Uh, and say so you got 10 traction points. So if you're using all 10 of those in a flat straight line, you are good to go. You're not breaking traction. You're very close to, but you're not. But as soon as you go up a hill and you're maintaining that throttle input, you know, that's all using all 10 of your traction points. It sounds silly to say traction points, but it makes sense when you think about it. Um, and you go up a hill. Well, that hill is now applying gravity to the car. It's wanting to drag the car back down the hill um, and now the tires not only are having to overcome the actual weight of the car in a straight line, that weight is effectively increased going up the hill. Hence, G-force. Increased G's more than, you know, one G. That's uh, effectively giving you more than one gravity, Earth's gravity of, of pull, right? But so you're going up that hill. And I'm not saying you're going up that hill at one G. One G's quite a bit, actually. But regardless, um, you know, you're going up that hill. Now, gravity wants to pull you back down it. That means you have to work harder to go back up it. So that means effectively the hill is taking, say, two traction points from you. Say it takes two traction points to go up that hill. Um, and you're already at 10 because you're accelerating hard. So you're already at 10. You add two more with that hill. Well, now you're at 12. You're over that. Boom. There's your wheel spin. Make sense? I, I hope this is making sense. I'm trying to explain a somewhat complicated thing in a non-visual medium. I don't just have a whiteboard I can write on here, uh, you know, because, you know, hey, this is audio. But this is interesting because, um, you know, rear-wheel drive cars uh, have a secret kind of weapon, and that is weight transfer. So, you know, if, if you picture a car as like a teeter-totter, right? And you got like a, a balance point in the middle and it goes forward and it goes backwards. If you are accelerating, it leans backwards. If you're braking, it dips forwards. Think of it like a teeter-totter. Well, in a rear-wheel drive car, when you accelerate, that weight transfers backwards. Where to? The rear wheels, which are the driven wheels in a rear-wheel drive car. So think of weight transfer as like artificially adding an extra traction point. So you get an extra point before you you know, lose traction. Um, and, uh, you know, this again is, this is tying into this, you know, phenomenon that happened with this high power car that Brian was tuning. But, you know, this also ties into your daily driving because say you're in your, you know, rear wheel drive car going up a hill. Well, a rear wheel drive car by this logic is going to have that, you know, benefit of weight transferring on the back. Also, the gravity pulling the car back that way is also going to help a little bit of weight go on those back wheels. And a rear-wheel drive car in a snowy condition should, in theory, and I'm going to put this to the test in a later thing. I'll let you know what happens. But it should, in theory, um, have more traction, have the advantage uphill. The traditional notion is that front-wheel drive cars are better in the snow because they have the engine over the front wheels, which adds a little bit of weight there. Think of that like tipping the teeter-totter forward. Makes sense? Uh, but when you start going up a hill, a front-wheel drive car, those front wheels are driven, the weight of the engine's up there, and the car's wanting to tilt backwards under acceleration, and the hill's pulling it down. All of these factors contribute to pulling weight off of the front wheels. The opposite effect of what happens with the front-wheel drive car in the snow, at least on flat ground. So, you know, and this is an interesting way to think about it. You know, the, the issue here, you know, with, say, this higher horsepower car that Brian was tuning, um, it was already maxing out. You know, that's a car that can exceed all, say, 10 points of its traction potential on flat ground. And then you combine that with going on a hill and succeeding that even harder. You know, and that's why that's going to spin. But, um... This makes sense even if you're daily driving because in the snow, having that lack of traction in the snow is like making your car a higher horsepower car as far as traction is concerned. As far as your tires are concerned, you know, you in a lower power car are going to be able to break traction a hell of a lot easier in slippery, snowy, icy conditions. And that is a lot like driving a really powerful car 
on dry pavement. So, um, you know, in this interest, it makes an interesting thing, right? Because I don't know if you've heard this, but, you know, there's a, you know, an old solution. If you're in a front wheel drive car and you're having trouble getting up a hill, um, the solution is to turn around and then back up the hill. And that's interesting because what you're doing by reversing up the hill now, the front wheels, again, of the car are the driven wheels. Um, you know, the engine power is going to those front wheels. And uh, now those are pointing down the hill. You're backing up the hill. And not only is the weight transferring onto those front wheels as you're reversing up the hill, you know, uh, it's also uh, getting benefit from having the engine over those front wheels, which are now pointing backwards because, again, you're reversing up the hill. Um, so you get like a double benefit. You get the weight transfer onto the rear wheels, and then you also get the added weight of the engine also being, I say rear wheels, think, okay, front wheels of the car that are pointing the other way around. There we go. Makes sense. Point is you have the engine there, you have the weight transfer going there, uh, and that would basically be the, the same thing as driving a rear wheel drive rear engine car up a snowy hill. So this is all interesting stuff, and it totally, totally applies to daily driving, and it's something I didn't even really consider a lot. You know, I drive cars on track when I can and really enjoy them. I drive a lot in the snow here in Colorado. Uh, you know, I've grown up out here driving in heavy snow in the mountains, and, uh, you know, it's not even something I thought about. Why does it work that way until I had this discussion with Brian when we were trying to figure out why this car was, you know, breaking traction on hills, but not elsewhere, um, so, you know, and maybe you can actually use some of this knowledge to your benefit, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, driving around in the winter, if you live in a flat, very flat place that does get a lot of snow. Yeah. A front wheel drive car is really going to be, um, beneficial there because the rear wheel drive car in a flat area with no traction is going to have less weight over those rear wheels. Unless of course it's a rear engine rear wheel drive car and you're driving a Porsche around in a blizzard, which is fantastic. If you're doing that, you're awesome. But that said, uh, that's also why people with rear wheel drive cars tend to put, you know, sandbags in the trunk. But in a hilly situation uh, with snow, the rear wheel drive car actually has the benefit. So interesting stuff, interesting things. Now, a front wheel drive car would have the benefit going downhill, you know, going forward downhill. The driven wheels now have the added gravity pushing down on them and the engine pushing down on them. But chances are in a snowy situation, you're not accelerating downhill. So you're not really benefiting from that extra um, you know, traction there. Uh, so yeah, interesting stuff. Now I would say, uh, the, this is also why the new Corvette, the mid engine one is so good because it puts a lot of that weight of that engine over the middle of the car towards the rear, putting more weight on the rear tires, rear wheel drive, rear engine, the ultimate, or here's the even better solution. How about this? All wheel drive. That's, that's usually the answer, actually. Anytime it's like front-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive. Now, now all-wheel drive. And then even better, let's have mid-engine, all-wheel drive. That is that is truly the ultimate for winter driving. So I, I hope all of this uh, rambling nonsense about traction and dynamics has made sense. To me, I find it very interesting, you know, as someone who enjoys performance driving, but as someone who drives in the snow. It's interesting to think about, hey, why do these things happen? And why does my car do this? And if you're just a daily driver driving around in the snow, hey, now you know. That's why that works. And what I'm going to do um, is uh, test this out in the future. I'm going to set up a uh, front-wheel drive car, rear-wheel drive car, same hill, same snow. I'm going to put this to the test. So when I do that, I'm going to let you know practically how this works out. But I can just tell you from experience, I think this is the way things work work so now before we get into anything else we're going to be talking about motorsports next and also team japan how toyota is saving the internal combustion engine that's next and now for how things work with an engineer transmissions shift and that was how things work with an engineer for more of how things work go to patreon.com slash throttle warrior as he now sees the checkered flag in the distance, powers down the main straight, and comes home to win the Qatar Grand Prix. Crofty on the call for that one. F1 in Qatar. Uh, they just finished that inaugural race this year. First time they've ever done F1 in Qatar. Of course, uh, congratulations to Lewis Hamilton. Just yet another F1 victory. 
that he has. Though I will say, uh, Max Verstappen, he wasn't a very happy camper, but uh, Fernando Alonso uh, did podium for the first time in like seven years. So that's all good stuff. Good things. F1. It's always a lot of fun. Now, speaking of motorsports, let's talk Team Japan. Yeah, this is cool. So uh, it, it's cool for the rest of us mere mortals not behind the wheel of an F1 car. Uh, so Toyota, Subaru, Mazda, Yamaha, and Kawasaki have all banded together to create what they call Team Japan. And they are the forefront of keeping the internal combustion engine alive and well in motorsports. Uh, and uh, they've basically pledged to all find ways um, in the you know light of electrification of a lot of things, consumer cars, but also race cars and everything, they have vowed to keep internal combustion running and you know do so by researching and using their collective efforts as giant car companies to find alternative fuels for existing platforms and i think that is fantastic they want to find carbon neutral fuels right so you know people uh, you know who support electric cars a lot talk about oh carbon neutral this carbon neutral that well the goal here make carbon neutral combustion fuel for fast race cars and make it you know something available to keep cars on the road i think that's it's such a noble cause uh, this is great they're truly fighting the gr- the good fight uh, and you know toyota recently refused to sign a pledge to phase out fossil fuel by 2040 now this coalition you know again it's dedicated to you know creating carbon neutral fuels for cars you know the the world is still fixated on electric cars being the only solution to save the planet which just isn't true there's other really efficient things that exist and uh, it's you know known that it is more environmentally friendly keeping an existing car on the road uh you know that's that's already done the damage when it comes to manufacturing and all of that stuff uh than it is to you know start producing new cars with new things and batteries and stuff that's all sorts of bad and you know toyota here came out in a, in a press release by saying quote by promoting further col- collaboration in producing transporting and using fuel in combination with internal combustion engines the five companies aim to provide customers with greater choice Yes, customer choice. We are the customers buying these cars. That is very important. Uh, Now, some of the critics of this are saying it's just a ploy to keep Japanese workers employed, but I would disagree with that. Uh, Akito Toyota, um, you know, the head man of Toyota, you know, Toyota, it's it's spelled spelled differently, but he is, uh, you know, part of the original family that founded Toyota. And, you know, he's a self-proclaimed car enthusiast, not just, you know, head of the company. Um, You know, he drives cars, he races cars, he does rally and stuff in his spare time, which is freaking awesome. You know, you could say uh, he's one of us, but um, (laughs) and, you know, he's he's wanting to keep this alive through the lens of motorsport because, you know, one great thing uh, about testing these new fuels is motorsports where you don't have so many uh restrictions when it comes to emissions and laws and testing if they're doing this in you know a different you know car test fleet or even doing this on the road there's a lot more restrictions into how they can do it but when it comes to racing nah go for it because you know racetracks and things like that that's the least of their worries um now so mazda and toyota are going to team up to co to develop a 1.5 liter sky active power plant for one of their race cars that runs biodiesel, Skyactiv again uh, is that uh, uh, engine technology that Mazda is using that uses the, uh, I believe it's the Atkinson cycle. Uh, it's a different cycle of actually combusting fuel than what we normally have. Uh, also, Subaru and Toyota, again Toyota, uh, are going to develop some biomass fuel uh to uh, do uh, their existing race cars and are going to test that racing. That'll be cool. Porsche, by the way, also announced they would be working on this a few months back, which is cool. So again, racing, best place to do this testing. You can really test the efficiency of the fuel over long durations. They can test its, you know, um, how well it works, how well it burns, how much power it makes, uh, how resistant to uh, detonation and, you know, knock and stuff like that it is. Uh, Very, very good things. All good stuff for consumer choice. I'm just in general pro consumer choice. You should be able to buy what you want to buy and I think that's a good thing and I want to see where this goes. You know, if they can make an affordable, easily available fuel 
that can be you know found in a lot of places and then use it in an existing platform and then be carbon neutral on top of that you know to kill the climate argument against it then um, I'm absolutely all for it uh, I mean I'm all for things that you know explode dinosaurs and make burnouts and and make power anyway but you know when you can have all of the good things and then be kind to the environment and kind to trees and, you know, and wildlife and stuff, uh, then, hey, who's to say that there's a problem with that? Now, obviously, you have supply issues. If this were to become a thing, well, how are gas stations going to get up? Whatever. This is really early stuff still. You know, they're still just testing these fuels in race cars. Toyota is also pretty married to the idea of hydrogen stuff still, even though the uh, Toyota Mirai... um, their hydrogen-powered sedan has been kind of a flop. Uh, fun fact that Mirai in Japanese means, you know, future, the Toyota future. But um, that's kind of been a sales flop, though it's a really cool car. Uh, hydrogen power, it's just the the infrastructure doesn't exist for that. And uh, that makes a, a tough argument against electric cars, which electric cars have still less infrastructure than regular gas cars, but they have more infrastructure now than even hydrogen cars. Uh, you know, but they are married to this idea. You know, that was a hydrogen fuel cell car, but they also... Um, have a race car uh, that runs on hydrogen as a combustion fuel as well. So you can burn hydrogen in a modified combustion engine, though from my understanding, uh, hydrogen definitely does not have the fuel density and the power density of regular gasoline. You need a lot more of it to get the same type of power, and in some cases it's not even possible to get the same type of power from a hydrogen-burning combustion engine versus a Hydrogen fuel cell electric car, that's where things get different. But, hey, that's where these, you know, biomass-derived fuels, we got to wait and see what more of that means. But when they're running these in race cars and, you know, maybe this is something you could grow, who knows? Or, you know what, again, let's just go to our own idea of, uh, you know, distilling our own ethanol fuel (laughs) at home. But, uh, yeah, I want to see where Toyota takes this. Team Japan for the future of the internal combustion engine. I like it. Hey, by the way, uh, if you want to interact with this podcast, you can do that, and I've got new ways for you to do it. Of course, you can still email your car sounds in to matt at throttlewarrior.com. Really enjoy getting those car sounds from you, and I will put them on the show. You can tell your friends, hey, my, my sound, my car is on the show. Go listen to it. It's really cool. And uh, then you can also send those in via the Facebook page. Again, look up Automotive ADHD on Facebook. Post your car sounds in the comment of one of the posts there. It will be really good. And you can, of course, subscribe to this podcast and wherever, uh, you know, wherever fine ones and, you know, this one are downloaded. And I want to thank you for spending the past half hour hanging out with me, chatting cars. I will see you next week when I enter NASCAR to race a guy with two first names. See you then.